Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Refocus webinar series. My name is Ashley Hood Morley. I'm the Senior Director of Sustainability and Materials at the Plastics Industry Association, um, where my role includes uh, serving as a staff liaison for the Recycling Committee, um, which through leadership of our Events and Education Subcommittee um, is the group that hosts and organizes our annual event, the Refocus Sustainability and Recycling Summit. Um, for those of you who have joined us in the first two episodes of this series, um, you've heard me express my disappointment in the fact that we are not meeting, you know, in person this year um, as we were scheduled to do in May. But we've really enjoyed uh, the past few months where we've been able to at least connect with you virtually uh, through these through these uh, online platforms, and we're happy to be able to bring you this webinar series. So last month we took a little break. Um, I hope that all of you enjoyed a little time off, a little we're able to get some vacation in, um, hopefully this summer, um, and enjoy some time with your friends and family. Um, but now we're back, and we're back with a really exciting uh, webinar just in time to kick off. Bioplastics Week here at the Plastics Industry Association. So um, today I'm going to be hosting this program along with um, our another moderator and speaker, Patrick Krieger, um, who also works here at the Plastics Industry Association and manages our Bioplastics Division, which of course is our host of Bioplastics Week. So um, without further ado, we are going to jump in, cover some brief background and housekeeping items, um, and then we're going to dig into uh, the really good bioplastics content that we have today. So first and foremost, as we always do, want to give a really big shout out and sincere thank you to the sponsors of this webinar series, Midland Compounding and Consulting, Plastics Machinery Magazine, Plastics Recycling Magazine, and Star Plastics. Um, please give these folks a virtual round of applause in your uh, own home office or wherever you're tuning in from. Um, thanks to them, we're able to bring this good content to you today. And because of companies like these, we are able to provide the same high quality content as we do in person every year um, through this virtual platform for zero dollars um, out of your pocket. So thank you again. Um, to all of these sponsors and please just keep in mind that this webinar series is going to keep going for the end of the year um, so if this some sort of sponsorship is of interest to you in the future um, don't hesitate to reach out in addition to our event sponsors we also have the privilege of working with many media partners um, on things like the refocus webinar series so those media partners include mold making technology plastics machinery magazine plastics news plastic technology and recycling today. So thank you to all of our friends um, at each one of these media outlets for helping us get the word out uh, about this webinar series. Next year, we very much um, look forward to seeing you in person. Uh, as time goes on and we're all still at home, uh, I think it gets more and more exciting to think about the fact um, that we we'll have an, an in-person event again one day. And so um, please earmark these dates if you haven't already. We'll have a uh, abbreviated event during MPE, um, May, the week of May 17th next year, 2021, um, at the Orange County Convention Center in Orlando. Um, and as I've mentioned before, um, we were thankfully able to reschedule our Cincinnati trip um, that we were supposed to do this year. To 2022, so please save the date, May 23rd to the 25th. Um, we will be back in Cincinnati as as planned, and we are so happy that we've already spoken to Influx and the local MRF. Um, so all of our tours are still planned. Um, so please save those dates. And finally, just a few housekeeping items. So first and foremost. Um, Although all attendee lines are currently muted, um, we will offer a Q&A session after all three speakers present today. Um, so keep in mind during this time um, and when you're posing these questions that we're still going to abide by antitrust rules. Um, we will refrain from discussing pricing, production, marketing strategies, anything that could be construed as market manipulation, we're not going to address as part of the content nor as part of the Q&A session. Um, I'd like to also notify all attendees, this is a public education session where members, non-members, and press may be present. 
Um, we're not going to be conducting any official business of the association today. This session is being recorded. Um, and slides and the recording um, will be available after we wrap up today. You will all receive a, a thank you for attending email from Plastic uh, with a short survey in that. And at the end of the survey, um, as always, you will be directed to the slide deck and the recording of the presentation so that you can view it um, at a later time. And finally, uh, the last thing is, again, I said we're going to have questions at the end of all three presentations. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the GoToWebinar format on your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, um, there is a question box. So if you'll just um, locate that question um, box, you should be able to expand that, type in your questions, um, and we will gather all of those. You can send those at any time throughout the presentation that something comes up um, that you want to address, and we'll hold all of those until the end um, and direct those um, to the intended speaker. So I think with that, we shall dive in. So today, we are really happy to present today's session titled Industry Collaboration in Bioplastics. And what I'm going to do is introduce our first speaker as well as our moderator for the remainder of the session, Patrick Krieger, who is the Director of Sustainability and Materials here at the Plastics Industry Association. So within this role at Plastic, Patrick focuses on several different uh, plastic, plastic industry association initiatives that are focused on sustainability. So I already mentioned that he, of course, leads our bioplastics division, um, which is uh, a lot of their focus is on educating and advocating for growth of bioplastics. Um, he also focuses on the new in-market opportunity project to facilitate supply chain solutions. Um, that promote the recycling of plastic products. Um, and to address the issue of marine debris, uh, Patrick manages our Operation Clean Sweep program uh, with the Plastics Division of the American Chemistry Council um, to reduce pellet loss during the production of plastics. And he also leads the global action team on marine debris to implement the principles of the Declaration of the Global Plastics Association for Solutions on Marine Debris. Not a mouthful at all. He joined Plastics in March of 2015, and prior to that worked for the Animal Health Institute. And Patrick is a uh, graduate from Texas A&M in 2007. So couldn't be happier to have this group on with us today. So Patrick is going to kick it off. I am going to go behind the scenes, but thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, I'll rejoin you um, at the end, but until then, Patrick, um, I'm gonna turn over control to you to take it away. Thanks, Ashley. Let's double check that this is going to work. Perfect. And you should now have control, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. All right. So I'd like to thank everybody, um, just like Ashley did, for attending this session today. Our refocus conferences, the topics we discussed, and the presentations by experts should simultaneously educate you and also inspire you. And whether this is your first day or your 15th year, it's my hope that you learn something today from today's presentations that you're able to take back to your office, or rather your home office for many of us, but take back to your office and implement. And while we're talking about bioplastics today specifically, I hope that you are inspired by the big ideas and innovations of the company speaking today, and that motivates you to make at least one thing better in, in, your, in your operation. So we have two great speakers for you today who are gonna talk about bioplastics and also more broadly about innovation, collaboration, problem solving, and implementing sustainability concepts that reach beyond recycling. Before I introduce them, I'm gonna do a quick 101 on bioplastics. That way everyone's on the same page and our speakers can jump right in. So today's session also kicks off Bioplastics Week 2020. Bioplastics Week is a media campaign to increase the visibility of bioplastics by driving digital conversations. We hold events like this one, and also post infographics, videos, and we celebrate leaders and the experts in the bioplastics industry. So for more information on the week, our partners, and each of the day's themes, go to the bioplasticsindustry.org slash bioplasticsweek URL at the bottom of your screen. And also don't forget to follow the hashtag on Twitter, hashtag bioplasticsweek. Oh, let's go back. So bioplasticsweek 
is organized by the members of the bioplastic division who work to educate, advocate, and collaborate on behalf of the bioplastic industry. Much of the information I'm going to talk about today was developed with their assistance, and I thank them for it. Also, much of the information that I'm going to speed through is actually found in greater detail in resources on our webpage. So go to plasticsindustry.org slash bioplastics to find them. All right, so what is a bioplastic? Quite simply, a bioplastic is a polymer that is one, bio-based, two, in some way biodegradable, or three, both. Sounds simple, right? Well, let's dig in a little bit more on each of those three concepts, bio-based, biodegradability, or both. So to be bio-based, a polymer must be made wholly or in part of a renewable resource, like corn, sugarcane, or canola, but also other items like the cellulose from wood, biogenic methane, or even algae. To be considered biodegradable, it's a little bit more technical, but we degrade through a biological action in a defined environment into natural compounds like carbon dioxide, water, and biomass. And please note, when I talk about defined environment, that's really important. So biodegradability is kind of like the word delicious. Pizza is delicious and ice cream is delicious as well, but they're delicious in entirely different ways. And so we actually tend to avoid using the term biodegradability and use other terminology that provides more specific information to the end user on how they can dispose of this product at its end of life. And so those can be things like industrial compostable, home compostable, anaerobically digestible, or marine and soil biodegradability. Also on, to on top of that, there's, there tends to be a new one that people talk about, which is freshwater biodegradability. And the other thing to think about is that it's very important that all of these things use a standard and are confirmed to an industry recognized standard, such as ASTM D6400, um, which is about the labeling of aerobically composted, essentially industrial compostable products. So remember when I said, ooh, that's fun. So remember when I said that uh, um, plastics can be bio-based, biodegradable, or both? Um, this is where we talk about this. And we'll make sure that we get a copy of this in a better format, um, that there's, there's less of the tweaks around. But so yes, we can have bio-based products that are not biodegradable in some way. Examples of that are polyethylene and PET. Um, we, you can have you can have products that are both bio-based and in some way biodegradable. Uh, common examples that people are aware of are polylactic acid, um, but also thermoplastic starch. And then you can also have biodegradable products that are in some way biodegradable that are made completely from fossil resources. A really great uh, common one for that is PVAP. Um, and people often think that because these products are less than 1% of the plastics produced in the United States or in the world in a year, um, that they are very niche and that they are hard to find. Um, but bioplastics are actually all around you and they're very common. Um, and yes, they are primarily used for packaging such as flexible, films, and rigid, but that's where it starts, not where it ends. They are, they are found throughout your life. So my glasses are, are made from cellulose acetate, which is a bioplastic. When I used to ride in cars more often, the foam car seats uh, were made from soy-based foam. And I also keep on the uh, compostable, industrial compostable plastic straws um, because I really can't stand paper ones. And actually, I can kind of go on and on about applications, but I know that we're gonna be talking about a few of those here in a second, and there's no reason to do that here. So with that, I would actually like to jump in and introduce are speakers. So our first speaker for today is going to be Kevin Hanrahan of Arkema, and our second one will be Michael Mang of Danimer Scientific. Kevin is the Chief Marketing Officer in High Performance Polymers for Arkema, responsible for global branding, digital communications, market messaging, and sustainability communications. He has over 30 years of experience in the specialty chemical space, 27 of which is at Arkema. He holds an industrial chemistry degree from the University of Limerick in Ireland. Michael is the Director of Materials Technology with Danimer Scientific, located in Bainbridge, Georgia, where his focus is on the development and commercialization of new biodegradable plastics that have an improved sustainability profile for Danimer's customers. 
Michael has worked in industrial biotechnology and biopolymers at Marriott, Nature Works, and Dow Chemical. And he also received his PhD in chemistry from the Pennsylvania State University. So at this time, we're gonna, we're gonna hand this off to Kevin. I'd like to remind everyone that while Kevin is unmuting and I'm handing it off to him, that you can submit any questions that you'd like into that question box uh, throughout this and we will talk to him at the end of the, at the, end of the session. Kevin, you should have the presentation. Um, okay, do I click on show my screen? Uh, no. Nope, Kevin actually will be able to share the presentation again for you. Okay, Kevin, you should be able to see that, and I've given you keyboard and mouse control, so you should be able to move the slides now. Okay, I'm clicking forward, but uh, here we go. Beautiful. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for allowing me uh, to speak on two topics, uh, honestly, that I am very, very passionate about. Uh, so one of them is true sustainability, which is kind of the obvious one. And then the second one is about storytelling, because in, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a marketing guy and it's my job to, to tell stories. So I'm going to go uh, fairly quickly and fairly deeply into um, uh, the story of sustainability. It is the story that is all about uh, a very high performance polymer called polyamide 11. Uh, Arkema is the only producer of this polymer for many, many, many decades. Um, it is 100% derived from the castor bean, and the bean is coming from India. So if I do my job uh, correctly over the next, you know, 30 minutes or so, I will try and, uh, you know, introduce you to uh, the, the storytelling that we've created, and maybe more importantly, how, how we created that story. I'm not trying to sell you anything today except uh, the power of, of storytelling. And if that is successful, uh, that will lead us to show you two little videos, each is just, you know, like two minutes long, um, that will bring you on a journey into the castor fields in India. And my ultimate goal here is to convince you that this is a very human story. So as soon as we mention renewability or sustainability, uh, you really should remember that it's a very human story. And I'll begin just by saying uh, at the beginning of my journey, and I, I started to make the story for Arkema, uh, I was reminded there is no such thing as an inherently sustainable crop. It all depends on the farming of that crop. So that's my way of saying that at the beginning, we, we spoke a lot about the castor bean and how it's resistant to this and resistant to that, and it's a really good player, blah, blah, blah. But, but they were very, they were very uh, clear in telling us right from the beginning that an awful lot depends on how you farm that crop. You can have the most sustainable crop in the world, but if you're polluting it with chemicals and you're using too much water, and you're using, you know, unfair labor methods, you, you can end up creating a very bad story very quickly. So that being said, I'm now going to try and introduce you to how we built, uh, I think, a, a fairly powerful story. I'm going to give you the backgrounds on the castor bean. I'm going to take you on a deep dive into the farming fields of, of India, and that's where uh, at least one of the videos will come into play. And then the third one is all about driving improvements and the, what we call the Pragati program. And I'll explain to you in great detail what Pragati uh, is. So the, the backgrounds are really very basic. I'm just showing you a picture there that I took with my, my own camera actually in Gujarat in India. And those, those are trucks and, and you can't see it in the photo, but there's like 20 trucks in a row delivering castor beans to the crusher all day, every day. So there, there's a heck of a lot of cancer farming in India. And to give you a little bit of a background, because obviously we're polymer people, right? So what, what happens here is, well, you, you, you cultivate the cancer plant. From the plant, you, you take the cancer seeds, very, very beautiful looking seeds. You can see them uh, there. Uh, from that, you, you crush the seed and it's about 50, 50, 50% 50 becomes oil and 50% becomes what they call cake. And then Arkema is, uh, is really unique in that we're able to take the castor oil, and which is a, a C18 fatty acid, 
And we have very complex, very specific chemistry to turn that C18 into a C11 and a C7. And the C11 is the portion that we, we then turn into, into a polymer. So of course, I could spend all day speaking about what's on this slide here, but I'm gonna move fairly quickly. Uh, all that being said is that uh, the 11 is 100% derived from the castor bean. And that's just showing you there again, it's about 50-50, the cake that's over on the right-hand side, the stuff that's left over is re repurposed as, as fertilizer. And it's the castor oil. Arkema is the largest industrial consumer of castor oil in the world. This is just a very complex uh, flow diagram to show you that it's not quite as simple as I showed you earlier. There are, there are many different nuances and different types of chemistry that we can play on the, on the 11 portion. And the two brands that we end up with, I hope that you've heard of one of them. Uh, one is Real San and the other is, uh, is P-Banks or New. And both of them in their respective fields are quite famous for being uh, high performance. So this is a, a kind of a historic uh, set of pictures. You see that these come from the past. The top left, uh, this is the team of scientists in 1947 that developed uh, uh, the, the Rilsen uh, molecule. And to be absolutely blunt with you, you know, they, they were not uh, sustainability conscious back then. Uh, it, they used uh, castor oil because they had access to castor oil, okay, and they did not have access to, uh, to petroleum. It was only uh, in, in several decades later that uh, sustainability kind of became a thing. Um, it was named after the real, the, the real river, so you see a little photograph that we took of, uh, of the river in, in France. And uh, I just want to share with you on the right-hand side that Arkham is going to make a, a big investment. It's over 400 million euros in a plant that we're building in Singapore right now that will be 100% uh, based on this technology. So now we, we start to get into the message a little bit. Uh, so I, I kind of give you a tiny little flavor of the chemistry. And um, one thing I didn't give you, by the way, is you know, where are these polymers used? They're used in very, very harsh environments. These are super durable, flexible materials. An awful lot in, in automotive and truck applications where you have exposure to, to, to you know, road salt, a lot of abrasion, a lot of, uh, a lot of impact, so really super impact properties. Used an awful lot in, uh, in sports shoes. If you're a serious runner and you buy from any of the Nike, Adidas, Puma, whatever, uh, those running shoes uh, almost always contain some of our materials. Very lightweight, very tough, super energy return. And when we speak about uh, about uh, sustainability, we can say um, on the left, first of all, durability itself is has a sustainability aspect to it. Things that last longer are inherently sustainable. So I would say we're we're playing more into a durable society than a disposable society. But that's really a topic for a, diff a different discussion. Uh, the one on top is where I would just say we kind of get lucky in that uh, our polymer happens to be 20% lighter than than most other polymers which means you're essentially using less material. And if you're building a car or, or a plane or, you know, you, obviously weight reduction is also a, a durability feature. But the bottom right is really what I'm here to speak about today, which is sustainability, not just bio-based. So what, is, what does it even mean? And, and I thank Patrick for, for setting the stage as to what a bio-based um, um, polymer is. And if we just uh, compare on the left would be, uh, you know, what we make, uh, what we make uh, polyamide 11. On the right would be more uh, polyamide 12, which Arkema also makes, by the way. Um, but uh, on the right, it's, it's coming from, uh, you know, crude oil. Obviously, crude oil takes one million years to produce. Uh, the castor bean can be grown in just a few months, actually, uh, only, uh, you know, less than, than half a year. And I know this is obvious to everybody, but it's always worth, worth saying, you know, where does the carbon come from? And when you have a polyamide 11 with 11 carbons, where did that carbon come from? Well, it came from CO2 in the atmosphere. So instead of creating CO2, it's absorbing CO2. You know, some people think that the carbon might come from, from the earth, from the soil. Well, it, well, it doesn't. It, it comes from the atmosphere. And just to use one term that is, that is really important, that, that carbon that is taken from the, the atmosphere is called biogenic carbon. So um, as, as I get into a little, I just barely touch up life, life cycle analysis in my next, next slide, the advantage in terms of climate change and, and climate impact indeed is, is that biogenic carbon. So of course, during the production of the polymer, we are using CO2 resources, just like you would with any other, but it's the feedstock. The feedstock has, has a negative production of CO2. It actually consumed uh, CO2. 
this is just a little bit of a, a life cycle assessment, which is a super complex topic, guys, which we, we just don't have time to get into today. But on top, uh, I hope you can see clearly PS6 and PS66, uh, approximately equivalent to PA12, but then about a 50% increase. And again, just to repeat what I already said, which is hidden in the fine print here, is that, that advantage that you see is coming from the biogenic, so you've sucked carbon dioxide out of the environment rather than putting it into it. And then on the bottom, it's just uh, the same kind of story, but now we talk about our PBAX products, which are, which are polyether elastomers, and, and basically just, just basically making the same point. Uh, we're, we're quite famous, I would say, in, in our particular space. In this particular case, I just show you that BMW uh, uh, awarded us for our, our sustainability. Uh, but more and more, I'm sure it's obvious to all of you now that more and more the, these big companies are really, really, they used to say, hey, we want bio-based. Now they want a hundred times more than bio-based. They want all of the details, all of the nitty gritty details, which is about, which is what I'm about to get into in the presentation. So now we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive on castor farming. This is a topic I'm really passionate about. Um, it's, it's really, uh, you know, 80%, 70, 80% of the world supply is, is coming from India, and you see this shaded portion of Western India called uh, Gujarat. Gujarat is a very um, desert, arid uh, type of, uh, of an environment, which in fact makes it uh, absolutely ideal for castor. So one of the points that we're going to make here in terms of sustainability, which is not so obvious, is that in many cases here, nothing else grows in this soil, so you may as well grow something. And the castor, in fact, grows very, very well. Um, there are 700,000 castor farmers in that region. That is an incredibly alarming number. Uh, if you can just imagine 700,000 individual farms. And as I get into the video, which we're going to show you in just a few moments, that actually is another dimension of sustainability that we'll do a little bit of a, of a deep dive. Uh, almost everything that I'm going to show you on the next few slides comes from a baseline study that we made in Gujarat. We, we literally went there and interviewed 1,000 farmers. So the story that we're going to show you is, is really their story. Again, 700,000, so very, very small farms. So again, uh, this, this is my way of introducing you to the fact that th th these are not huge companies you know, with thousands and thousands of acres and huge equipment and, you know, kind of monopolistic uh, industry. It's completely the opposite. These are absolutely tiny, tiny farms. You'll get, uh, you'll get many of the details in the, in the video, which should be coming up now. So, Ashley, I'm going to turn it over to you. This will be a great time if you can play uh, video number one, and hopefully technology will be on our side, and I hope everybody can hear it. Okay.
Thank you, Ashley. At least from my end, that was absolutely perfect. I could uh, I could hear it and I could see it uh, perfectly. So I hope everybody had the same uh, experience. So um, that's that's the story in in India. Uh, let me see. I hope I can control the slides. Okay. So um, as you can imagine, um, you know, again, I'll I'll just mention our big customers and I'll just mention a couple like uh, BMW or Nike or whatever. It is absolutely not enough to just go and say, oh yeah, you know, bio-based polymer comes from castor. Uh, almost every little sentence that was in that video is, is, uh, is um, examined and questioned. Uh, the number of farmers, the number of family members, what, what does it compete with? You know, what is, it, what is the standard of living of the farmers? Blah, 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 blah. Almost, almost every single thing, in fact. But that's why I say this, this really is a very human, a human story. It's all about farming. It's not just about the bean, which is, you know, to them, is, is the final product. So uh, based on the, the interviews with the thousand farmers, number one, they say uh, the, the main reason that they grow cancer is that it is highly profitable. Now, that is a major sustainability claim. That's not an obvious sustainability claim, but it's a very, very positive one. These farmers do this because it absolutely improves their standard of living. So now we can say, you know, not only are we taking care of the, of the planet, but we're taking care of a huge community uh, with, within the, the farming region in, in India. Very little input, so it's, it's easy. You plant it and, and basically forget it, and it's easy to grow. It's ideally suited for poor or marginal soil, so in many cases not, nothing else will grow there, so, so take advantage of it. You also have the monsoon effect in India, which is a natural phenomenon that you, you take advantage of. Uh, they have a legacy in castor, and, and then uh, the castor market is, is easily accessible, and the crop is easy to sell. Now, again, in terms of sustainability, that means that it's, it's a very transparent uh, supply chain. Uh, these farmers, I don't think I have time to get into it uh, today, but these farmers, they, they treat the castor crop as, as cash. And if they are ready to, to sell, they'll, the, uh, I'm sorry, if the price is high, they'll, they'll go and sell immediately. If the price is going to be down, then they'll, they'll literally use it as a kind of a bank account and they'll save that crop until the, the price uh, re. So this is way, way too detailed, but it's just to show you the crop cycle. Uh, right around now, as we're in August and they're planting, after the planting, you, you start to get some germination, monsoon rains are kicking in. And you could follow this clock. I think these slides will be made available to you. It's, it's kind of nice to understand the, the whole cycle and the whole story. I really don't have time to get into all of those details today. The, the, main, the main advantages that we probably pulled out in, in the video is really uh, there is no competition with food. Now, that is a major, major concern within the biopolymers uh, uh, industry. If you, have a, if you have a feedstock that is somehow competing with food, uh, that, that presents a whole, a whole bunch of other challenges. And once you move into so-called kind of third world areas like this, where you're, you're you know, taking advantage of the, the arid conditions and whatnot, uh, you also have to make sure that there is no uh, deforestation. Uh, for example, if we were to grow the beans in Brazil, that would be a major, major concern. But there is no deforestation in, uh, in Gujarat. So uh, the, the outcome, this is uh, the 1,000 farmers that we, we spoke with. The outcomes are, are fairly well um, laid out in, in the video. Uh, you know, it's a profitable crop, no competition with food, no deforestation, small farms, very nice uh, family uh, atmosphere. Um, so what are, the, what are the negatives or what are the things to, to focus on? And in fact, uh, the things to focus on, we have learned are basic chemical hygiene. Uh, these are farmers that have farmed forever. Um, they're, not, they're not fundamentally open to modern personal protective equipment. So that's a challenge. We have to teach them. Uh, also, irrigation techniques, they take advantage of the monsoon and whatnot, and there's a lot of water wastage in terms of irrigation. It's not efficient and effective. So um, the crop spacing is not very good. Uh, you saw that the gender equality, you saw that in the video, is not very good. So, so all of these things need to be worked on, which brings us to the creation of Pragati. Pragati is, is a consortium, Arkema, BASF. Giant Agro, who, who make the cancer beans, and then Solidaridad. You see the picture of Solidaridad here. They are the people that teach that teach in the fields. So all that being said, now, now it's our turn to go back to the, the, the farms to improve the situation, identify the things that need to be improved upon, which we just mentioned, and now take some action. 
So we created, this is driving improvements, we created the uh, Sustainable Cancer Code. Uh, basically, the mission of Proganti is, uh, you can read through these bullets here, but it's really to enable more sustainable farming through good agricultural practices, find those practices that are not quite good and improve upon them, and uh, the ones that are already good, again, just, just try to help them and try to, to improve. So these are the four members, which I already mentioned. These are the principles. So we, are, we have created the first, we call it success, which is the first uh, code uh, that can be audited uh, against so that each of these farmers meet, meets a certain sustainability uh, criteria. And as a result, uh, we just show you very quickly here some of the impacts after uh, three years of Pragati. Um, you see uh, on the top right, probably the most significant one is a 50% uh, increase in yield. Now that is a major, major, major increase. So you can imagine if these farmers are making their living from castor and now all of a sudden they're making 50% more castor, it's, it's really huge. Uh, 3,000 farmers, so I, I hope some of you would agree that that's a good number, but then others of you will, will clearly say, but there's 700,000 farmers. This is only three out of 700. And yes, you're right, but we, you have to start somewhere. So we started with 3,000, we're heading towards, towards 7,000 as quickly as we can. Uh, safety kits, you see on the left-hand side, so each of these farmers has been given a safety kit. Each of them has been uh, audited. And uh, the bottom uh, statistic here is that you have a 25% improvement in water consumption, which again is one of the weaknesses that we've identified. So um, if technology works a second time, we'll show a second video. So Ashley, I'm gonna turn it over to you again. I, uh, I would uh, really be happy if this goes just like the first one.
Super. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, again, from my side, that worked uh, just beautifully. So I hope everybody else had the same uh, experience. So it's coming up on 1143. I'm going to take uh, just a couple of minutes uh, to conclude here. Um, I can just take control here. Here we go. So if you follow you know, everything that we showed you on, on Pragati, so, so why would the farmers get, get involved? Well, it reduces their, their costs because they become more educated on more efficient use of materials. Um, it has a definite um, positive impact on their, their own personal safety and hygiene. Uh, higher yield, so you can imagine higher yield gives you uh, gives you more money. Um, higher selling price, there is a demand again uh, from end users to say uh, we don't want just just polymers that come from castor beans. We want we want a certified program. We want to make sure that uh, that, that that this was followed for our particular polymer, so we can we can uh, we can realize a premium at, at the end user. Uh, lower water usage, uh, which is really, if you have to pick on one weakness of castor farming today, in fact, it is kind of the, the lack of knowledge in terms of, of water usage. So as we move into uh, phase two, uh, I think I already mentioned, we wanted to scale up uh, to 7,000 farmers. And at this stage, I would say one of the biggest uh, deliverables for us is really to make, make this more famous, which is kind of why, why I'm presenting today. It's to show, uh, hopefully, hopefully successfully demonstrate uh, how a, a sustainability story can be built. It's not all positive. It's it's mostly positive. There's some negatives mixed mixed in there that have to be uh, addressed, and taking action on those negatives is really what it's all about. And then you you have a continuous uh, improvement process, which is which is what the the whole program is 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 fundamentally based on. Um, to, to conclude, um, our, our catchphrase on this is, uh, is let's grow together. We're putting our money where our mouth is. So uh, I think I already mentioned we're building a new plant in, uh, in Singapore. Um, it's on track uh, to be commercial uh, in 2022. And 100% of the feedstock in that plant in Singapore will come from, uh, from Astroid. So that's that's it. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Patrick and Ashley and Al are going to send out um, like a PDF version of the slides that you've just seen. Um, we're very happy to share this with the with the broader audience. My only one point is, if you are going to use any of these slides, they are copyrighted, and please you must you must give uh, attribution to the fact that they are owned by uh, by our company. And that's it. Um, I think I'm going to turn it back to to Ashley and Patrick at this point. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I am. Um as pleased as you are that technology um, works for us today. So thanks again. Um, always nice to have uh, to have a little uh, a little video to watch during these, these presentations. So thanks again, Kevin. Um, Michael, I will be handing over control to you. So you now um, should be queued up and ready to go. Just unmute your mic and take it away. Thank you, Ashley, uh, for the introduction. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, Ganimer's experience with development commercialization of PHA. And uh, we've talked about uh, the, the topic being industrial collaboration. Uh, and I'd like to uh, tell some stories about the ways that we've been collaborating with partners to uh, improve the sustainability of the plastics industry in general, and really, you know, describing the very beginnings of an approach that we think will help to do that. I'm going to start today with a brief introduction to Danimer and talk about PHA, um, and then talk a little bit more about some of the design attributes and the ways that people think about improving sustainability, uh, some of the key requirements that need to be addressed as you're looking at sustainable materials and then talk about some of the successes that we've had so let me see if i can advance here uh, here we go all 
All right, so uh, Dammer is a small company. Uh, we were founded in 2004 in South Georgia, and our focus is on the uh, development and commercialization of biopolymers. Uh, we are really highly focused on specific customer solutions, sustainable solutions that are designed to uh, really address specific problems that are brought to us by our customers and our partners. Uh, we believe that uh, by practicing a renewable sustainable model that, that we'll be leading by example and in the long run make meaningful contributions to the development of a, a circular economy. Uh, as I said, we are small right now. We're about 165 people uh, in locations in Georgia and Kentucky. The photograph on the right is our uh, brand new uh, PHA manufacturing plant uh, located in Winchester, Kentucky, which is near Lexington. Uh, that's been operating now since November of last year. <clears throat> so Patrick talked a little bit more, uh, a little bit earlier about what biopolymers are. I'm not going to going to uh, belabor that point. But what I do want to talk about is that environmental performance is really a value that is owned by a consumer. Um, we can provide polymers that have, uh, for example, renewable feedstock, new carbon, as, as uh, Kevin so eloquently described earlier today. Um, and some people have a lot of, place a lot of value on that. Other people care more about performance at the end of life. You know, the, uh, the, the polyamide 11 is not a biodegradable material, but some customers, consumers care a lot about what happens to the material at the end of life and that it goes, you know, it goes away in a, in a more sustainable way. Uh, and other people care about materials that are to intersection of both, that they want materials that are uh, both renewable, they care about the source, and they care about what happens at the end. But the, the, the message there is that that is really a values question. It's not, you know, we can look at, at from a purely objective standpoint, is one better than the other? It depends on what you care about for the product that you're purchasing. That drives a lot of design decisions, both for us as you know, people that make molecules, as well as people that make things and people that use things. So it's important to take those things into consideration as we're designing new materials that we're trying to be improve sustainability with. Likewise, one of the key design decisions that, that we have to make is what do we do about disposal and disposal routes? Um, there is, uh, for some com customers especially, it's important that uh, the material works in a system where the disposal is designed. And this could be a anaerobic digestion where material is designed to be flushed into a a sewage system or an industrial compost facility. Other people care more about accidental or unintentional disposal. Uh, you know, if what happens if my material ends up in, say, a lake or an ocean, or if it's discarded as litter uh, or gets blown away as litter, uh, does it need to degrade in a soil environment or in a marine environment? These are all of the the things that need to be taken into account. And this, again, is not a consistent, constant uh, factor for every customer. You know, if you have someone that sells, uh, say, uh, plastic bags and all their customers live near the ocean, they may care more about marine degradability than a consumer that's, you know, well, where, where their customer base is in, you know, central United States, where there's not as much uh, likelihood that material is going to end up in the ocean. So again, these are criteria for design that have to be taken into account. And the key message is that there's not a single best or only answer. There are many, many answers depending on what uh, a specific customer needs. So what is PHA? Uh, PHA is a natural polymer. Uh, 
uh, it's a polyester that is produced inside many bacteria as a carbon storage medium. If the bacteria finds itself in an environment where there's an excess of carbon, it wants to keep that carbon around for future use, uh, kind of the way that uh, you know I collect carbon around my belly when I eat too many cheeseburgers. It's the same concept. It's carbon storage medium in bacteria. Uh, the micrograph shows uh, what these look like inside actual cells. So you get essentially a, a granule of almost pure PHA that's surrounded by the cell, uh, you know, in a, a production uh, fermentation that we do, you know, it'll have between five and eight of those little granules inside each cell. So PHA is being a natural polymer have some diversity, a structural diversity. Most of the PHA that's found in the environment is PHB. The R group is a single carbon. And people have developed uh, PHAs where there are one and two carbons uh, as a side chain. And, and uh, I'm not going to talk too much about those because what we've found and where we think there's more interest in terms of the properties that can be obtained are when those R groups are longer than two carbons, and they're three, four, or more carbons. Uh, those we call medium chain length PHAs, and we find that we can get substantially better physical properties out of the natural polymer when the structure includes those kind of side chains. And if we think about other polymers that we know well, uh, you know, high density polyethylene uh, is highly crystalline. It's a fairly stiff, you know, comparatively speaking material. And it really doesn't have any, uh, any side chains to speak of. It's just polyethylene. Let's it crystallize easily. Um, and so the, the figure on the top is a PHA or a depiction of a PHA like the one found in nature, PHB. It's one carbon side chain, crystallizes very, very easily. Um, and has, uh, you know, reasonable but not terrific properties as a tool for designing new materials. But when you start introducing these medium uh, side chains into the PHA structure, you start breaking up this crystallinity. And, you know, the best way to think about it is now I've got, I've gone from high density to linear low density polyethylene, still polyethylene, much more flexible, much lower melting, much more easy, more ready processing. And this is again all brought about by the structure. When we have a lower melting point, it opens the processing window. We can uh, process these materials at much lower temperatures and in a much more practical way. We also get more ductility. The, the linear PHA tends to be fairly brittle. It's hard to do anything where you need any kind of impact strength. Whereas when you have these medium side chains, medium like side chains, uh, you can improve that ductility uh, dramatically. We have the ability to both change with what that side chain is, how many carbons are there, and how many of those side chains get incorporated. We do that all through biology. But what that gives us is the ability to provide materials that have functional performance that is uh, needed for specific applications. So uh, one image can change an industry. This is a, a photograph taken uh, from National Geographic of a sea turtle with a plastic straw embedded in his nose. And this uh, viral video and image that, that went out really changed people's opinion about some the way that plastics are used, especially near the coast, and that uh, led to bans on plastic straws. Um, you know, it really took something like this, something that people could relate to, to say, hey, maybe we need to think about doing something differently with, with straws. So what are the alternatives? Well, you can go to permanent materials, metal, glass. Um, those present problems, uh, hygiene, sanitation. You get a paper, which is really not a, a very good option. Or you could have a plastic that will biodegrade in the ocean and not be available to injure marine wildlife. So this is really what started our path to 
a resin that can be used to make green biodegradable straws. Now in the, the old days, uh, you know, we'd sit down with a bunch of other guys with white coats and glasses and write equations on the board and say, what do we need to do to get to a straw? And we found that uh, we could speed things up by going to what I'll say functionally focused design, where the focus is really on identifying what the performance process and other attributes are with a customer hand in hand. And when you think about you know, a straw, what does it have to do? Well, you have to be able to apply suction and deliver a liquid. Can't break when you're using it. And it has to get to the end use customer and be intact, you know. Now you'll note that nowhere along the way did I say it needed to have a tensile strength of this or a elastic modulus of this. It just has to work. You have to be able to make it into something. So we can provide pellets of, of resins and, you know, make small handfuls in the laboratory, but at the end of the day, it has to be processable on production equipment. So by collaborating, we're able to get to an understanding of what does what do the physical properties, the molecular topology need to be in order to get to a product that will process practically. And finally, as we're doing it all, all this manipulation, we still have to make sure that we don't do something that interferes with the end of life requirements. So Danimer uses uh, reactive extrusion to modify the properties of biopolymers, PHA being one of the many that we use. Um, but really all that is, is using the extruder as a chemical reactor, adding whatever we need to affect the reaction that we want, as well as putting in all of the, the fillers and additives and other things that are needed. And what that does is lets us change molecular properties and do it very quickly. And what that means is that we can actually get to a product that will work the way that it was intended. Um, it took us about five months to get to a prototype from the idea of, hey, let's, let's make a straw that's marine biodegradable to something that actually would run on a production machine. And then it only took a few more months after that for that product to get out in stores. And so now you can go to Walmart in the US or online and buy the sustainable eco straws that are marine biodegradable, plastic straw that, you know, if you hold it in your hand, it's gonna look just like any other plastic straw. But if it does accidentally get into the marine environment, it's not gonna persist in such a way that it will harm marine wildlife. I think that as we look forward in the, the bioplastics industry and how we're changing the paradigms of the way people use plastics, whether it's uh, through renewable re, uh, raw materials or through different ways of managing end of life scenarios. Uh, it's important to realize that collaboration is the key for all of these things. Um, you cannot change the way people do things by simply inventing something and saying, hey, look at me, this is gonna work great. You really need partnerships throughout the entire value chain in order to move things to market. You know, there are, there are too many players from us as a raw material manufacturer to an end consumer for us to be able to do this alone. And so, you know, we've got some established strategic partnerships with major brand owners. These are just a couple of them where we work hand in hand on the development and commercialization of new materials. Uh, you know, some commercial, the, uh, the Frito-Lay uh, industrial compostable chip bag is a commercial product. Um, as well as developmental, we're working on on water bottles with Nestle to uh, look at new ways to provide more sustainable packaging uh, for these major brand owners. And what we find is that doing this is really the best way to, uh, you know, basically get us to market and make a, a meaningful change in the world more quickly. It's less risk if we know what the customer is going to want. Uh, you know, there's less risk there. We know what properties are needed 
Um, you know, we can design, oh, well, we think it's got to be like this, but if, if someone who's actually selling the product says, no, it has to have this characteristic, we can get to that much faster. And really, that's what this is all about, is, you know, if we're going to change the way people do things, we can't take 20 years to do it. We have to be able to do this in a rapid fashion. Uh, and, and that's what we're about and uh, where we think that collaboration is the key to the future. So I'm going to end with our vision of, you know, a cleaner environment, a more sustainable world, uh, different ways of using plastics that don't cause more harm and provide more value to people. So thank you. And I think, Ashley, we're ready to switch to questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. So I'm going to, um, we will leave it here on this thank you page for the Q&A. So I'm going to send requests to, um, to our speakers now. So if you guys want to turn on your um, webcams, I'll send you those requests now. And we'll move right into the Q&A session, which is always more engaging whenever we can see your smiling faces. So um, thanks so much to both of you for speaking. Um, Michael, I just have to say this. Um, your very first slide made me smile because I did my engineering co-op at the Winchester facility. Of course, it wasn't Danimer at the time, but um, it was uh, where I spent three or four years of my life. So um, it just goes to show you guys how full circle um, your life can come sometimes. So thank you again to both of you for excellent presentations. And Patrick, I'm going to hand it off to you. Um, to facilitate this discussion. Thanks, Ashley, and thanks to both of our speakers. Ashley, you made the, the comment about the Winchester facility. We also had comments in the uh, in the question box about people who are from Gujarat. So it just goes to show how small the world is on top of how small, you know, kind of the plastics industry is. So, and that we're all kind of connected together. So. We've had a few uh, questions come in and there are some really great ones. Please feel free to continue to add those in as, as we have them. Um, I'd like to start with one for Arkema, um, which is, um, can you speak more about the LCA model and what your scope was for, for your, your LCA? Kevin, I believe you are currently muted. I'm going to unmute you. Kevin, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, thank you. So I'm not an LCA uh, expert by any means. Um, the slide that we showed you is basically uh, just taking the, the total climate change impact. Uh, we compared um, polyamide 12 versus polyamide 11. We're, we're producers of, of both. And again, the, the only difference on the polyamide 11 side was the subtraction of biogenic carbon. Now, I do understand that uh, according to some of our customers, they, they do give credit for biogenic carbon and, and others do not, depending on their particular sustainability model. So in our particular case, we, we absolutely are taking credit for the biogenic uh, carbon component. I'm sorry, I can't give you a better answer than that. I'm, I'm, I'm not an LCA uh, expert. I'm a, I'm a marketing guy. <laughs> Um, do you know how much water is used per pound to produce your uh, polymer? Oh my God, that is a super, super question and a super complicated question. It, it, it all depends on what do you mean by used, okay? So if you're in a chemical plant and you're adding water into a chemical reaction and somehow that water ends up in the polymer, then you used that water, right? I mean, no, nobody would argue with that. But when you're in uh, when you're in a, a, a castor bean field in India, and there's a monsoon uh, torrential rain that's falling down, and on top of that, uh, one, once it turns dry, then you're irrigating. Okay, are you really using that water? Have you consumed that water? It, it's very very subjective, guys. What does use mean? At its most fundamental level, you could say the only use of water is the oxygen and hydrogen that has been taken from the water molecule and has been chemically bound onto that, that oil that becomes a polymer. And that's a tiny amount. But that's generally not what people are, are asking. What people are really asking, and I hope that this is generally what the question means, is if you look at all of that rain and that irrigation compared to other crops, 
is there a lot of water or a little water? And the answer is, it is a lot of water. There is an awful lot of water used in the production of castor oil. But again, is that really, really consumed? Uh, that, that, that deserves a much deeper, a much, much deeper analysis. And I would say, first of all, I would say that, that only irrigation should count. Monsoon is given to you from, from nature, so I, I don't think that should be counted at all. It should only be a, a irrigation, and it should only be that per, a portion of irrigation that is captured by the bean it, itself, and how much has then been translated into, into the final polymer. Uh, having said all of that, uh, the two things that we need to improve upon, and I think I said it in my presentation, that chemical hygiene is, is not where it needs to be, and water consumption is not where it needs to be. And just to give you one, one tiny example, when we see the farmers irrigating without intervention from Pragati, they basically flood the entire field. And they wait for evaporation to take its course and for penetration to take its course, and that's their irrigation. Whereas Pragati will tell them, absolutely no way, you do not do that. You have targets, you build little furrows, you build little, little, little um, valleys along, along the root system, and you target that, that water in, into the roots. So, so far we've made an improvement of 25%, but we have a long, a long way to go. So I'm sorry that was a really complicated answer to a question that is, that is really a big question. Yeah, well, and, and as you pointed out, in your program, you're, you've already reduced production by water use by 25%. So, so it sounds like you have a really great start and, and you recognize that, that there are still, um, there, there's still progress to make. Yeah, and if I can just add one thing, because I think uh, I probably missed the opportunity to say this. In this particular region of the world, you could, you could almost say it doesn't matter how much water you use. The water is going right back into the water table. Who cares? The concern is, is, is there competition with drinking water? Okay, because, because this is, this is a, an area that doesn't have, have a lot of water. And the answer there is no. We're absolutely making sure that there is absolutely no competition with, with drinking water or for water that would be used for food. And in fact, it's an inherent advantage of castor bean. It is drought resistant. It, it's going to grow. Even if you don't water it, it's going to grow. The yield will be lower, but it, it will grow just fine. Whereas food crops will fail. So these farmers, they have food crop and they have castor. They will, if water is going to be short, number one is they're going to, they're going to give water to their family. Number two, they're going to give it to the food crop. The last place they're going to give the water is to the castor. Yeah. We have a lot of really great questions coming in. I'm going to mix it up and I'm going to jump between the two of you. So, so Michael, um, uh, we have some questions for you about your PHA product. So um, you mentioned straws. And I think you also mentioned bottles and bags. So what are the kinds of um, products or markets that you're currently looking at exploring? I think broadly you could say that uh, single-use pack, uh, single plastics and packaging. So uh, we, we said bags and bottles, but, uh, you know, really it's, it's things where people are, uh, you know, when we talked about the values of core design, Things that fall in that sustainable category, things that are both bio-based and biodegradable, uh, whether it's uh, things for uh, you know coffee pods or cutlery or bags or things like that, those would be examples of the kinds of things that we're producing. And we have the the straws are being sold commercially today. Uh, the plant uh, started up in November, and we're still working through. You know the final stages of development and commercialization for some other products. So there, there should be some new things coming out in the next uh, you know few months, really, uh, that we'll be able to talk about more. Um, also mentioned, and congratulations on your your recent DOE funding in this area. Is do you do you uh, how do you plan to use that? Like, what's the focus of that research? Well, the um, a lot of the, the that type of work is focused on improvements and whether it's improvements in the biological production you know what what are things we can do to be more efficient uh, what do we need to do to design molecules that have better performance and then how do we show that uh, those materials are working you know that's uh, longer term uh, research and the, the DOE funding is going to help us to uh, do all of those things really. So 
I'm seeing a lot of questions um, that, that broadly address recycling. So again, I'll jump back and forth. Uh, Kevin, um, your, your nylon, it, it, it's not biodegradable, correct? Correct, yes. Is it currently recyclable? Um, are there plans for how to recycle products made from, from the nylon? Yeah, so in fact, I would say it's, it's highly re recyclable. So I'll bring you back to probably the, the first sentence of my presentation is that you know, we're, we are more, and this is uh, across all of Arkema's uh, high performance polymers, we are much more invested in uh, highly durable applications. So it goes a little bit different uh, to Michael's story. And uh, no, no less valid, it's, it's just, it's a different direction. That typically the things that we go into last a long time. Okay, I mean many of the uh, many uh, one example is the production of crude oil. Okay, not the most sustainable market in the world, but it has found a home for polyamide 11. And and those huge pipes that are you know just giant uh, one meter pipes that go down to the bottom of the ocean, they last for you know 40, 50 years in in there, and and they are they are absolutely specified to do that. But the answer to your question is then at the end of the life, if you pull those big pipes up out of the ocean, can, can you recycle? The answer is absolutely yes. So their, their durability in their application uh, translates into, yes, they can have a second life and a third life and a fourth life and no, and no problem. So we've created what's called the Virtue Cycle Program. I think if you do a quick uh, Google, you'll, you'll find that uh, uh, very quickly. And in virtue cycle, in fact, it's it's uh, it's different to Michael's model, but it's kind of complementary, I would say, in that in fact we try to match up totally different applications. So I think that the oil the oil um, pipe is a good example that you could you could pull that up out of the ocean, you can regrind it, reprocess it, and now put it in a completely different application. You put it into a sports shoe, or put it into uh, grind it into a powder for three D printing of, of of something else. So the answer to your question is yes, polyamide 11 is a highly recyclable uh, um, um, product. Again, targeted at uh, durable and not disposable applications. And now we have the Virtue Cycle program to kind of enable a cross industry recycling. So the other, the other part, so um, Michael, so your products are, are broadly biodegradable. So industrial compostable all the way to marine biodegradable. Um, do you have any concerns or do you, how do you answer questions about the impact on the recycling industry? Right, so recycling is, you know, virtually every thermoplastic is recyclable within itself, right? And so we've done in-plant demonstrations where you know, we'll take trim scrap from a thermoforming line and, and reprocess it multiple times without any difficulty. But the question is, when you think about a post-consumer recycling stream, that's a different story. Um, you know, we're doing most, and, and I'll step back and say, most of our customers care more about a bio-based uh, end-of-life scenario, whether it's degradation or composting or whatever. Um, but there's still that question of unintentional disposal. If we make a bottle and it ends up in a PET stream, what's the impact? And, and we're still working on that. You know, this, this is, um, these are new questions for us. Uh, as, we've, as we've grown, uh, we're getting questions that are different than, hey, I just want this to be industrially compostable. Now we're looking at these global questions about recycling and what is the impact on the post-consumer waste stream composition and, and how does that matter. Uh, for a lot of the, the products that, you know, we're, our customers are looking at, you know, say a, a flexible film for snack food packaging, you know, it's going to be food contaminated waste. The polypropylene version that exists today is not tremendously recyclable. You know, it's contaminated with oil and salt and, you know, flavorings and things like that. And it's a, it's a complex structure. So we're trying to design something that will still give that same performance, but will allow the consumer, instead of throwing in the trash, can put it, say, in a home compost environment where it will degrade in a reasonable amount of time in someone's backyard, even though it's a complex structure. And more importantly, because it's, say, food contaminated, it won't further compromise the recycle stream. These are complex, in, you know, macro environments that we're trying to fit and design materials for. Uh, and, and since many of these questions are, are really, at the end of the day, value-based questions, 
know, Kevin values and Kevin customers value the renewability and bio-based side of it. Our customers value the end of life more than the, the bio-based or, or with that. The recycling is, is really also a value-based question. You know, do I, is, is recycling the best way to get rid of a material with these characteristics? It may or may not be, but we're, we're investigating it and, and, you know, we'll, I think the, uh, we'll have some answers over the next, you know, say six to nine months uh, as we're trying to assess really what the impact would be on post-consumer recycling streams. Yeah, th this is a this is a question that's discussed a lot at the bioplastics division as well about about how we think about where bioplastics is in the context of the broader plastic industry. Uh, I think that I, I probably have often expressed my frustration with the fact that that if your goal is to never interrupt and, and never disrupt the recycling stream as it currently exists, you you essentially are just tacitly agreeing to only being able to use the polymers that are currently out there. And what we're trying to do is provide better, you know, better polymers that have different uses um, for all sorts of different types of product applications and customers. Um, so let's see. So there again, there have been a lot of really great questions coming in, some of them more technical than others. Let's go high level here. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned is the partners that you're working with in the Fergassi program, that it's not just Aquabot, that it's you, it's BASF, it's others. How do you begin to have these kinds of questions on collaboration between between all of these different types of parties? Like where does that even begin? Yeah, it's it's a good question. It starts with um, I would say in our particular case, uh, you know, Arkema, I, I mentioned, we're the number one consumer of castor, and, and frankly, until four or five years ago, uh, that, that was enough, you know, a bio base, yes, is it castor base? Yes, that, that's enough. Um, um, but we, we started to get much, much deeper questions, you know, tell us about the farming, tell us about the conditions, tell us, tell us answers to many questions that we just, we didn't know. Um, BASF, I can't speak for them, but I think they are probably the number two consumer of cancer. And they typically, typically go into completely different applications, not polymers, some polymers, yes, but, but many other healthcare products and whatnot. And again, uh, they started to get a lot of questions. So when you have the two uh, big, biggest uh, vested interests in, in cancer being quite unable to answer the pertinent questions, you start to say, you know, we, we, should, we should work on this uh, together. And then you have um, uh, getting closer to the source. You have Giant Agro, who makes the castor oil, and they're they're much closer to the farmers, so they they certainly can help us. And the, the most significant addition is uh, you, I mentioned Solidaridad, and that's an essential element. They're not a chemical company; they are an absolute uh, NGO that that teaches and 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 they they know the castor industry, they they know the farmers, they know the community. So it was kind of a natural a natural fit uh, for us to to come together. Uh, the real the real question is you know how do you start and and you you start I'm sorry but you you just you just you start by starting you know uh, you just say let let's interview a thousand farmers let let's find out what the and and you you build it from from the ground up uh, if you look at at the number seven hundred thousand farmers uh, it's it's too big it's too scary uh, the the temptation is always there to say let's not even start how how can you possibly be successful. But again, we speak to some consultants that they're very clear in saying, you know, you, you don't have to solve every problem in, in one day. And the, the world understands that you, you bite it off one, one bite at a time. But, but I would say uh, for Arkham and BSF to, uh, to, as number one and number two to come together in, in, a, in a common mission to improve their sustainability message, that that was really how it started. I, I hope that kind of answers your question, Patrick. I mean, I, I think so. I think it's... Um... I think it's a good point that that if you if you try to eat the whole elephant at the same time, like it it, it becomes quite overwhelming. So yeah, and if I can make maybe one more point on that. And now that Fraganti is is up and running, and and you know we, we need to make it kind of famous, uh, so that other companies can say, oh, okay, so so there is a sustainable cancer initiative. Okay, let, let, we have an interest in that. So let let's us join. You know. And, and many more companies jumping on, and, and hopefully other other polymers and, and other industries 
with a similar challenge to us. We'll, we'll look at what we've done and say, yeah, well, we, we can do our version of, of forgotten. Uh, that, that would be the, the win-win situation for everybody. Yeah. So also, uh, just as a comment to attendees, I am seeing a lot of, of questions around uh, pricing and things like that in the, in the chat. So we're going to avoid those um, as we're going through here. Some of the more technical ones that we don't get to as well today, um, I'll make sure to share with the, the presenters so that, you know, if they'd like to, they can follow up with you on those. Um, so, so, Michael, my next question to you is about kind of communication, because as you've, as you've mentioned a few times, you, you're talking about um, preferred end of life versus, you know, I guess, worst case or, or unplanned. Um, especially when we're talking about into the environment products that may unintentionally get leaked into the environment. How do you communicate about those products in a way that doesn't also encourage littering? Is that something that you think about when you're, when you're either marketing it or working with your partners to market? We, we absolutely think about it. And it's, it's actually turning into more of a challenge than we expected. You know, the industry and has created these certifications so you can get a, a TUV OK compost certificate if you meet the standards of the ASTM 6400 or whichever standard you're using. Uh, and, and those work well. But do you want to uh, tell someone that it's OK to throw, say, a drinking straw into the ocean? No, <laughs> you really don't. Uh, so there's a, a delicate balance on how you communicate that physical property to both a, a partner and a consumer, and then how do they craft their message? Because again, they want to encourage good behavior and discourage bad behavior. Even though it's okay, technically, you still don't want to do it. You know, you don't want, I'm just going to throw my, my trash in the ocean. Then when you start looking at the, the properties of the materials themselves, if you have a, say, a, a, a you know, clear plastic bag that uh, has good physical properties, looks like a, a traditional bag, but it's a marine degradable bag, what do you need to put on that bag so people can differentiate it? And do people even want to go to the expense of that? You know, if you look at the straws that uh, our partners are making, they're really indistinguishable from a polypropylene straw. So how do you tell someone? How do you communicate the value of that? And, and those are, I think, things that people are still experimenting with. You know, there's not a single good way to say, hey, this is a more sustainable solution than what you had before. It's, it's just, you know, imagine, uh, you know, Kevin has similar issues. Here's a uh, a new polyamide, high performance material, how do you communicate the benefit of that? And we can we can talk in our marketing materials about it, but you know, really a lot of this is for the end consumer to know what the right thing to do is at the end and to understand the value of what they're holding in their hand. And at that very granular personal level is where that communication needs to be focused and targeted. And I don't think we've found a good way to do that yet. You know, it's easy at the high level to say, oh, well, here's, you know, bioplastics are great. You know, we can buy billboards and, you know, ads on the internet. But at the end of the day, when, uh, when, when a consumer holds an article, you know, I'm going to stir my coffee with this coffee stirrer. How do I tell or how do I know that it is bringing something new to the world that you couldn't do two years ago? How do we communicate that? And that's not, we haven't figured all that out yet. And I think as an industry, that's going to be one of our biggest challenges to be able to make that, to target that communication so that it ends up at the right place at the right time. Thank you, Michael. And I know that we're uh, right at right about at time. So uh, before I turn it back to Ashley, um, I'd like to personally thank our speakers for their time today on, on the discussion of these topics. One of the things that I thought was um, most remarkable essentially is your, your kind of candidness about where we currently are, that we don't have all the answers, that, that no one person does, and, and we're, not at a, we're not at a point where all of those are developed anyway. So um, I, I think it's inspiring to know that, that these conversations are ongoing and that, that we're still looking towards improvement. So things are only getting better from here. 
Um, again, uh, thank you to the participants. Um, please feel free to reach out um, with the email addresses that will be linked in, our, in your thank you email. And also, don't forget to follow the hashtag Chiropractic Week on Twitter. So back to you, Ashley. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so I just have a couple of things really quick to wrap up um, at the end, you guys. Um, thank you again to all of the speakers. Um, this is a topic that is a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. So it was really interesting uh, for me to kind of get to sit back and, and listen as an attendee today. So thank you guys. Michael, thanks for taking me back to uh, oh, many, too many years ago. Um, I'll just say one more time, thank you again to our speakers who make um, this webinar and all of our other webinars possible uh, to bring to you at no cost. So thank you to Midland Compounding and Consulting, Plastic Machinery Magazine, Plastics Recycling Magazine, and Star Plastics. Um, we are going to continue right on uh, through our webinar series. Um, we, we have September, October already planned for you. So if you visit refocussummit.org and navigate to the webinar series section of the website, you can start to see those details populated there. Um, but the uh, registration is already open for our September version. So um, telling our sustainability stories is the title of episode four. So um, we have the full description out there. I invite you um, head on over there to uh, check that out. I think it's going to be yet another great set of uh, speakers. And then in October, we focus on chemical recycling. So thank you again. Um, see you guys in September. And in the meantime, have a great rest of uh, the week. And don't forget, hashtag Bioplastics Week. We'll see you on social media.